Hello, everybody, and good evening. Uh, my name is Captain Chris Little with Why We Lead, and today I have the honor and pleasure of being here today with uh, Lieutenant General Retired Deptula, David Deptula, currently serving as Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. So, sir, I'm very grateful to have you on today. Hey, it's great to be here, Chris. Nice to talk to you from halfway around the world. <laughs> Uh, if you could, for the, the audience, uh, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and how you ended up kind of where you are today. Yeah, well, that's a big order. I have to tell you, you know, I spent 30, 34 plus years in the Air Force um, and I had a magnificent uh, career. Um, but let me do my best to summarize it, uh, kind of the high points. I grew up uh, in an Air Force family. Um, my dad, uh, actually, I'm third generation. My grandparents immigrated from Poland in uh, 1914 uh, and then uh, he fought uh, as a private in the U.S. Army in World War I uh, in the trenches in uh, 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 Central Europe. Uh, my dad uh, was an aviation cadet uh, and uh, had poor vision so he couldn't fly but he became a aircraft maintenance officer for B-24s and B-29s in the oh. Pacific and then later uh, went on to get into nuclear weapons effects testing and uh, development. Uh, and so he was in research and development, but I've never met an individual uh, since then. Of course, I'm a little biased because he was my dad <laughs> and quite an influential figure to me. But I've never met someone who was such a strong proponent of air power than my dad. And, uh, uh, he, you know, he didn't rise to uh, high rank. I mean, he retired as a lieutenant colonel, but he, <laughs> He was dedicated as an, as an engineer and an officer uh, and uh, really had some leading edge visions like composite materials and hypersonics that are now coming around today. So the bottom line, the reason I tell you that is because I was influenced from um, early, early times. So my dad was a voracious reader. He loved the library. So I spent half my childhood going to the library with him. And I don't know if you're familiar with Craven and Cates, but Craven and Cates is the uh, a multi-volume history of the U.S. Army Air Forces in World War II. Uh, and I read portions of that um, since I was a little, since I could first start to read. So I had Air Force Blue uh, uh, part of me as I was growing up. I knew that I wanted to join the Air Force uh, before I went to college. Um, and uh, I went to the University of Virginia in ROTC, yes, Mr. Jefferson's University. And that played a critical role uh, in my development too. And back to my dad, uh, and, and I don't wanna to get too mired in these details, but he had me set some goals for myself at a very, very young stage that was extremely important to my development. Um, I stayed on, on at the University of Virginia to get my master's degree uh, right after I got my uh, commission and then came into the Air Force active duty in uh, 76, went to pilot training, was the second or third, I can't remember which, class of lieutenants to get an F-15 right out of flight school. I was a brand new airplane at that time. Awesome. And then I went on and I spent the next 10 years doing what most uh, young officers in the Air Force do, and that's uh, learn their particular specialty. Um, so I got a lot of flying time in the F-15, uh, uh, see, my first uh, assignment was Holloman Air Force Base, New Mexico. I was initial cadre standing up a new unit mm -hmm. um, at the 49th Attack Fighter Wing. Uh, and uh, I was a member of the 7th Attack Fighter Squadron. And, uh, and a squadron mate of mine happened to be a guy by the name of Buzz Mosley, who you mm -hmm. might uh, uh, recognize. And uh, Tom Hobbins was a captain with me at the time. Uh, after that, I went over to Kadena Air Base, Japan, initial cadre again. We were in the first group of F-15s that stood up uh, awesome. uh, at the 18th uh, attack fighter wing at the time. Uh, and there happened to be in that group of people, I can't name them all, but General Speedy <laughs> Martin, Ken Hess, Fig Leaf, Dan Darnell, um, uh, future Surgeon General of the Air Force, Peach Taylor, there were 15 lieutenants and captains that were there in 1979, 1980, that later became general officers. Wow. Uh, which is kind of interesting. That is awesome. Um, uh, but then after Kadena, or I, I actually I went to fighter weapon school at a Kadena Air Base. Then I got an assignment 
as an air staff training officer. It used to be a program called ASTRA. It's a fellowship, essentially, where you go on to the Air Force on the air staff. And so I spent a year in legislative liaison uh, getting some exposure to what it's like inside the Pentagon. And that was an incredible experience. Um, but I'd just come out of weapons school, so <laughs> it was appropriate. I wanted to go back and, and teach what I learned. So right after that, I spent a year in the Pentagon. I went and became initial cadre and the wing weapons officer at uh, Tyndall Air Force Base uh, at 325th uh, at the time, attack fighter training wing. A guy by the name of Chuck Horner, that name might be familiar. Uh, General Horner, who uh, was the three-star uh, air component commander during Desert Storm. Well, he was a one-star at the time, and I became his instructor pilot. That becomes awesome. real, real interesting later on. Uh, but then I, after I was there at Tyndall for four years, I went to Armed Forces Staff College, came out of there, got my first full-length assignment in the Pentagon, uh, working for a guy by the name of John Warden. Uh, in the uh, Office of Warfighting Concepts Development, uh, went on to uh, uh, basically interview and then got selected to work for the new Secretary of the Air Force, uh, uh, Dr. Don Rice, uh, and uh, uh, had some incredible opportunities there. Uh, happened to be the guy that ghost wrote uh, Global Reach, Global Power. Uh, uh, that has still uh, one of the few things that has survived in the Air Force uh, for 30 years. Uh, wow. and, and so after that, I mean, I got involved in uh, the planning for the initial Desert Storm Air Campaign inside the Pentagon. This is a whole story on them all of its own. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been a couple books, um, uh, one by Rich Reynolds, uh, entitled Heart of the Storm that talks about a critical period of time um, that I was involved in. Make a long story short, um, I ended up going over to, uh, actually down to uh, CENTCOM to brief General Schwarzkopf with General, uh, or with Colonel Warden. Next day I'm on a plane to Riyadh. I get over there, General Horner asked me to stay. So uh, it, it's a longer story than that, but it's sort of how I got involved in becoming the chief architect and planner of each and every day's camp attack plan, master attack plan, which I wrote for Operation Desert Storm. Mm -hmm. um, coming out of that, come back to work for Dr. Rice again, finish up my uh, time in the Pentagon. Uh, and then I went down to Eglin Air Force Base uh, and I became that there's a great, uh, at the time, um, uh, unfortunately, we don't do these competitions anymore, but there was a William Tell competition. I don't know if you ever heard of that, but that was sort of yes, a, a, a series of air-to-air -air competitions where you determine who's the best air-to-air uh, -air fighter squadron in the Air Force. They used to have gun smoke for the air-to-ground squadrons. Uh, and, and make a long story short, General Speedy Martin, who was a wing commander at that time, made me the commander of the William Tell team. Okay. Um, I finished up at the, uh, Eglin very quickly. I got selected for National War College, came back to Washington, went to National War College, and then was asked by General McPeak um, if I would be the Air Force representative to the Congressional Commission on Roles and Missions. Uh, so that was the last major roles and missions review that the Department of Defense had. That was 94, 95. I came out of that back to Eglin, this time as the operations group commander for the 33rd uh, fighter wing. Uh, then I got a call shortly after that, to come back to the Pentagon to be the Air Force representative to the National Defense Review, which was part of the first quadrennial defense review. Um, and, and so that was an interesting year back sort of into the overarching uh, uh, issues of determining what our nation's defense policies ought to be in four structures for the future. Uh, then out of that, I got uh, selected to go to Turkey, uh, Ankara, Turkey, not Ankara, but uh, um, uh, Interlake, Turkey. And I was a combined joint task force commander for Operation Northern Watch, which was the no-fly zone over Northern Iraq. So I'm one of the few people in the Air Force who actually has commanded Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine components in combat. Um, which was a magnificent uh, tour. Uh, coming back out of that, I come back to the Pentagon, this time to stand up the Air Expeditionary Force construct, 
and then become uh, the Air Force lead for the second quadrennial defense review, during which time I happened to be in the Pentagon when uh, actually two quarters away uh, when the terrorist Al-Qaeda aircraft hit the Pentagon. Uh, that's a whole story all on its own. But again, in the interest of, of uh, uh, getting through this as rapidly as I can, I'll skip it, except five days later after that happened, the brand new Chief of Staff, General John Jumper, called me down to his office and said, Dave, we'd like you to go over to the Middle East and uh, be the first combined air component commander for America's response to the 9-11 attacks. Wow. Uh, so I went over there and uh, did the planning for the initial stages of Operation Enduring Freedom. Um, I already had an assignment uh, to go down to Air Combat Command uh, to be the Chief of Plans and Programs, did that for a while, then got called over to the Pacific um, for a previous commander of mine who is uh, General Beggart, the commander of the Pacific Air Forces, who wanted me to become the uh, Pacific uh, uh, Director of Operations for uh, PACAF. Um, so I did that um, in a change out in commanders. Uh, then they asked me to take the position as a Vice Commander of PACAF, got promoted to three-star and become the first um, war fighting headquarters commander, which was a new organizational construct that uh, uh, General Jumper had put into place, uh, which was essentially a numbered Air, Air Force uh, commander that oversaw engagement and did, did the war planning. And in fact, I was the Joint Force Air Component Commander for the PACOM commander at the time, uh, Admiral Fallon. Okay. Uh, so I did the PACAF thing, a Pacific thing for about uh, uh, three years. And then one day I get a call from the commander of PACAF who said, Dave, Joe Mosley just called me, and we've got a job we need you to do. Uh, we want you to be the first Air Force three-star uh, uh, director, not director, uh -huh. uh, but deputy chief of staff for intelligence. And I thought to myself, my God, I've spent 30 years in operations. I, of course, I didn't say this, but I thought this <laughs> in about 15 seconds. Then I went, well, I know exactly why it wants me to do this, because I've been a consummate user of intelligence in war and peace for the last 25 years. So I came back to the Pentagon uh, and uh, asked him to consider not making the position just a deputy chief of staff for intelligence, but intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, and to, room, and to move all the authorities for um, uh, remotely potted aircraft, UAV, drones, whatever you'd like to call them, mm -hmm. over to um, uh, my purview, uh, and he agreed to do that. And so I finished up my, uh, my time uh, in the Air Force as the Deputy Chief of Staff for Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance, which was incredible because I got to stand up this whole new organization and shed a lot of focus that had been missing on intelligence and also oversaw the increase in remotely potted aircraft, uh, UAVs, drones, by um, over 1,100% uh, wow. during my time frame. So then after that, I, I retired. I did. I had absolutely no idea what I was going to do when I was retired. <laughs> I did a little business stint with a defense contractor, but immediately after that, uh, pursuing some high-tech options, um, uh, my old uh, friend, uh, who I'd known for uh, a long time, who was the president of the Air Force Association, uh, and the chairman, General George Mulner, asked me mm -hmm. if I'd come over and stand up, basically reinvigorate the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. Um, so that's what I'm doing now. That's what I've been doing the last, it'll be seven years in August. Wow. Um, and uh, it allows me to continue to apply um, uh, many of the elements that I feel so passionate about during my career and develop uh, to continue that mm -hmm. and help the Air Force help itself as well as the entire uh, Department of Defense community and the joint and combined operations. So um, that's about as quick as I can do that. So well, I, uh, I think I, that was a fantastic job of fitting 34 years and a couple, several minutes. <laughs> Yeah, let me highlight one thing that is 
I feel very, very fortunate about. And if I, you know, one of these days I'm going to write a person, a paper on force management, personnel management in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I don't, it wasn't planned this way. No one sits down in advance, although I did when I was, I don't know, TC cadet at the University of Virginia and mapped out a 30 year career. I wish every young Air Force Academy, um, OTS and uh, ROTC uh, cadet would do that. Not because that's what you're going to do, but it gets you to think about your entire career. And what you end up figuring out is after you look at and you actually you realize, holy cow, i got to get all this stuff into 30 years? Schools, technical training, uh, maturing, operational experience. What you do, what you realize after you look at that is that you know, the career's not in a particular specialty, and that's part of some of the challenges that we have today. The career's in one of being an officer in the United States Air Force. The career is in leadership. The career is in advancing the institution of the United States Air Force writ large. Um, and, and so if I go back and I look at my career, and if you go back and you analyze what I told you, I was very fortunate Starting uh, about 1988, that first full-time uh, assignment at the Pentagon, to have a position on the air staff, and then I go out to the operational world and was a commander or a leader or a planner. Then I came back to the air staff or a joint assignment or an OSD assignment. Then I went back, you know, so... <laughs> So I, I was the planner in Desert Storm. I went to be a flyer and, and, a, and a leader of William Tell and mm -hmm. deputy logistics group commander. I forgot that in uh, at Eglin Air Force Base. I came back to National War College, commission on roles and missions, insight into joint operations. Then I go back to be an operations group commander, back to the Pentagon to run QDR. So at every level, Okay, I'm I'm going I'm 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 I've worked for every chief of staff and knew them personally back to General Welch. Wow. I mean, you know, personally briefed them, participated in activities. And 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 so it's that mix of headquarters experience, operational experience, not just Air Force operational experience, because then when I'm my joint command um, uh, as the joint task force commander. Uh, that gave me an incredible insights. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was that staff operations, staff operations that really brought together. When I come back to the Pentagon now, you know, unfortunately, there are many people, their first assignment to the Pentagon is as a three-star general. It takes them a year to figure out how to get to the bathroom. Uh, it's a big place. You know, when you hit the ground running, you, but when you, you know, do that when you're a captain, anyway. So I was very fortunate in that regard. I wish everyone had that opportunity. Well, I really appreciate you giving all that insight. Um, that, that's a lot to kind of take in and um, think about. Uh, I wanted to go back to your uh, childhood a little bit and kind of you, your father was your mentor, essentially, and you read a bunch of books and everything. And uh, I'm a huge proponent of reading and uh, constant kind of self-development. Um, how do you think that helps set you up for the rest of your career? Because it sounds like that's kind of what lit the fire in you. To well, kind of become it did. Your... First, I, boy, oh boy, I tell you what. <laughs> Listen, when I went to the University of Virginia, mm -hmm. I majored in astronomy. Um, I wanted to be an astronaut at the time uh, until I got to flight school and, and found out what it was like to actually fly a, a maneuvering <laughs> aircraft. And then I said to myself, why would I just want to be a bus driver? You know, just kind of sit on a rocket. I teased my good friend, uh, General Kevin Chilton, who's uh, flown the space shuttle three times into space. Wow. And who is a former commander of Air Force Space Command and uh, Strategic Command uh, about that because we <laughs> flew F-15s together. Uh, matter of fact, I taught him how to fly the F-15. Wow. Uh, but, but be that as it may, um, history is incredible. I, 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 I diverted a second there. I was a major in science, and I thought, I mean, in a hard science, because astronomy is essentially applied physics. Mm -hmm. Okay, a lot of mathematics and physics. And I thought sciences like psychiatry, not psychiatry, but um, psychology uh, and uh, history um, were kind of wimp subjects, okay? Mm -hmm. 
you know, those are for people that just, you know, flaky <laughs> degrees. Um, but let me tell you something, Chris. As I got more and more senior, now what I tell people, if there's anything, if you're considering or someone says, what, what should I study, which I get involved in, two things I tell them is history and psychology. Because <laughs> one, history provides you insights and experiences that you never had. And, and, and like Santana said, you, you know, if, if, if you don't study history, you might not I mean, this is a variation. Uh -huh. You're going to repeat it, or at least, you know, uh, what happens is going to rhyme with what happened before. So you need to understand and learn from others' experiences. Uh, and psychology, psychology is all about working with people. Mm -hmm. yeah, true. And if you want to lead and if you want to get ahead and forget getting ahead, if you want to get things done, you have to learn how to work with people. You need to understand that not everyone is going to agree, nor should you associate yourself with only people that think like you do. Uh, it, it, it is, and, and you need to realize that, okay, I mean, have you ever heard of the Myers-Briggs test? Yes, sir. Okay. No one ever explained to me why we took that test in war college. <laughs> um, but I, my rationale is well what it does is it teaches you that there's a whole variety of different personalities and perspectives mm -hmm. and 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 so if you understand that you know you won't get upset when somebody disagrees with you um and in fact you'll want to talk and and garner association with people who have different perspectives so mm -hmm. history is extraordinarily important um, reading, uh, not just history, but even current affairs, allows one to expand their experience base. So I, I'm, I'm not too passionate about that, but holy cow, I tell you what, um, uh, that it, it, history, I can't underestimate the value of history in my preparation. And then that first assignment, I didn't tell you, I, I was assigned in the Air Force Doctrine Division. Ah. In 1988, working for Colonel John Warden at the time, uh, and a guy by the name of Mike Dugan, who mm -hmm. was, again, Chief of Staff, but at the time he was Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations, and Chuck Boyd, who was the only POW um, who became a four-star general uh, and was one of my mentors. I had magnificent mentors. That's awesome. Um, but I learned from interacting with them, uh, but reading and doctrine, being in the Air Force Doctrine Division, that's right when joint doctrine development was being constructed. And I was in charge as the Air Force's representative for Joint Chief of Staff Publication 3-01, which was Joint Doctrine for Interdiction. When I go to meetings with my joint brethren, the Navy guy, the Army guy, and the Marines, they knew their history. So uh, fortunately, I got a leg up a lot earlier when I was a kid. But even then, I read voraciously just to be able to make counter arguments. If you don't understand your past, you, you're not, a, regardless of what your career field is, you know, you can't make a good case for your position. So I, I don't, sorry to beat that horse dead, but uh, really important. It, it's, it's uh, and that's why I wanted to bring it up idea. because ha have you met successful leaders in the Air Force who uh, were not voracious readers? No. But, no, I, I mean, you know, I don't know. I didn't interview every one of the leaders that I that I knew and and, <laughs> and asked them what was their latest book that they read. But yes, sir, you know, most of them read. Um, so, kind of talking about uh, mentors a little bit. You said that's kind of what helped you, uh, starting with your father, and then all throughout the Air Force. Uh, you just mentioned one of the generals you helped mentor, and they helped mentor you. Uh, how important is it for uh, particularly a young person early on to kind of find and latch on to a mentor to help kind of catapult and keep, uh, you know, just goal oriented and like, hey, this is kind of what you need to be doing? Well, you can't have just one and you don't want to have just one. What you want to do is learn from all of the seniors that you associate with or run into, or you know something about uh, and want to take an interest in. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I have people reach out to me all the time who I, you know, don't know, or they, you know, when I have to tell you when I was a commander of Northern Watch, it's before the Air Expeditionary Force. And so rotations were 45 days. Oh. So when I was there for two years, I mean, thousands of people came in and I personally briefed everybody when they showed up uh, on the rules of engagement and what we did and what the historical. So I'd go back in the Pentagon and be walking around someone, hey, Gerald Abtula, how you doing? You know, I'm so-and-so and and I'm thinking to myself, you know, you you can't possibly remember all these folks. (laughs) But later on, they reach out and they ask questions, and it's it's wonderful. So what you want to do is you want to you you want to involve yourself with as many different kinds of folks as you can to get different perspectives. But you get that senior perspective as well. What you don't want, and mentorship is not crony cronyism. Okay, you don't want to lob onto somebody and have them be your ticket, so to speak. Mm-hmm. What you want to do is you want to learn from their experiences. Um, and, 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 and be able to uh, 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 develop from the multiple uh, uh, people that you run into in that regard. Uh, and I had many of them. Um, General Chuck Link, uh, who uh, w- was an incredible individual who could, he knew history inside and out. Um, I worked for him uh, during uh, the commission, uh, well, I was associated with him during the Commission on Roles and Missions. General Tom McInerney. I was a captain at Kadena. He was the one-star air division commander. Um, he, I talked to him last week. You know, some of these relationships you form uh, for, uh, for years. Uh, Colonel John Warden. Mm-hmm. Uh, John has a very, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a interesting history himself. Uh, and uh, uh, General Chuck Horner, you know, there's another one. Uh, mm-hmm. Completely opposed positions uh, and philosophies, uh, but I learned from both of them. And also, I was one of the only ones who could talk to both of them uh, and take the benefits that each provided. Um, and, and, and so, uh, mentorship is extraordinarily important. Mm-hmm. Uh, General John Jumper, who I first met as a current when he was a colonel and I was a lieutenant colonel. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so it, it's important to get to know folks uh, and, uh, and, and learn from them. You think that helped diversify your perspective a little bit, knowing all those different personalities? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm coming across over, you know, over <laughs> my entire career. Yes, sir. Uh, but yeah, you got to understand how influential folks are, too. Mm-hmm. Um, in one of the places that I can remember, uh, uh, well, shoot, why not tell the story? Um, uh, it, it, it happened long enough ago. Um, no, let me do it this way. Okay. Let me do it this way. Cause I, I don't want to, I don't want to get some people into maybe a perhaps an uncomfortable situation. But when I was a cadet, okay, an ROTC cadet, my ROTC professor of aerospace sciences, are, are you, did you go to the academy or ROTC what? I was OTS, sir. Okay, OTS. Um, my good friend, Gene Renuart, OTS, okay. Um, I remember my professor of aerospace science, who was a, a it was his last assignment before that, he was a B-52 wing commander. The captain in the detachment was a non-rated guy mm-hmm. who was every bit as motivational as my father. Um, I have to tell you, when you are a cadet, the impact and the importance of the instructors is absolutely incredible because that's your only viewpoint at that time to the service uh, in the Air Force and the military. A very important time. And then, you know, as you get on and on in your particular career, Mm -hmm. um, it is important to get that diversity of perspective. And and so, uh, yeah, I I learned a lot from uh, from different folks and folks in the other services as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Retired uh, uh, Lieutenant General Bernie Trainer, Marine Corps, 
actually I worked with him in one of the books that he was writing about the desert storm. And then I later got to know him during the commission on roles and missions uh, and senior uh, civilians as well. John White, who was the commissioner of the, the lead on the commission on roles and missions later became the deputy secretary of defense. Um, uh, Ash Carter, uh, I got to know him when he was a, uh, uh, ATNL acquisition tech, uh, technology and logistics guy and later the Secretary of Defense. Um, so one of the lessons here too is, you know, you, you wanna wrap your arm around everyone you can, uh, uh, even if you don't necessarily agree with them or they don't agree with you, you wanna learn from them. That's awesome, and that's kind of why I started the, the Why We Lead is to kind of help uh, put that arm around, you know, people digitally uh, sure. in case they don't have it in their particular uh, organization at the time. Right. Uh, I want to talk about writing a little bit. When did you start writing? And um, I know that coincides with reading a little bit, but how and when did you kind of start writing? Well, um, obviously I started writing in college. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I actually no, I take that back. Here's another one. I just thought ran into my, uh, my dad encouraged me to write a column for the high school newspaper. I just thought of that, or just remember that. So um, I wrote a weekly column for the uh, uh, Fairfax, whatever it was. I went to Fairfax mm -hmm. High School. Uh, and uh, basically what I'd do is once a week I'd sit down with them and I'd go, hey, Dad, what should I write about? And generally, it was a defense-related, uh, national security policy-related issue. Um, so that's how I got started writing. So you found your niche early on. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, they weren't Pulitzer Prize winning <laughs> uh, you know, uh, editorials, but I, I, that's when I started, started writing. And then, I mean, okay, then you go in the Air Force, you become a fighter pilot, you go to F-15, and you're not doing a whole lot of writing. Uh, a matter of fact, it was kind of discouraged in the squadron to be even associated with reading anything or writing unless it was for the Fighter Weapons School Review. Um, you know, I can remember um, going into the restroom and sneaking a copy of uh, uh, Air Power Journal, uh, make sure no one's looking before I, you know, went in the can and see what was in it. Um, so you have those culture things you gotta deal with too. Uh, but, but, but really when back on, you know, on active duty, um, the, the first standout was I ghost wrote an article for General Dugan when he was the Deputy Chief of Staff for uh, Operations about the operational art of war. Uh, back in the mid 80s, uh, operational art was becoming, uh, seeing a, a, a renaissance, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I wrote that article for him and then sort of my next big project, I mean, clearly when you're in the Pentagon, you write lots of position papers and so on and so forth, um, <clears throat> full of background papers and briefings. But my next, next big writing project was Global Reach, Global Power. And I wrote the mm -hmm. white paper that Dr. Rice signed. Uh, and uh, then I, after Desert Storm, um, I really got involved with the media a lot. They, would, they sought me out, they asked me questions. And let me take a bit of a tangent off of writing and talk a little bit about media because most military people, um, for whatever reason, are raised to disdain the media. Mm -hmm. um, terrible thing to do. Because guess what? The media is going to print a story um, or tweet or do a podcast or whatever <laughs> nowadays. Back then it was print a story, okay? Yes, sir. So it became real obvious to me after reading some really stupid defense stories. Uh, you know, there was a thing called the early bird. It's still out there. Um, but the Air Force used to be the ones, the Air Force public affairs folks are the ones that first developed the early bird. And it was a bunch of clippings from all this, this is before the internet, before electronic means and they assemble them every day and first thing you do when you get into your pentagon office you kind of go through the early bird see what the, the big topics were and some of the stories were just ridiculously stupid 
Well, there's a reason for that. Most, they weren't getting informed, so they wrote whatever they wrote. So early on, I became, I developed this habit of, of reaching out, putting your arm around the reporter and telling them what you could. Now, obviously, when you get into classification issues or things, you can't tell them. Um, but you describe the situation to the best of your ability. Well, that also then translated over the years into writing. Mm -hmm. um, okay, a, a, after uh, Global Reach, Global Power, um, I went to National War College, you know, so I started writing about the Gulf War, my experiences there, um, the whole background behind uh, Global Reach, Global Power. Then I get on the Commission on Roles and Missions. I'm assigned the Deep Attack uh, Weapons Mix uh, Study to write about, so I do a, a full up study on you know, the balance and allocation of what's the most cost effective ways to project power in the American military across all the services, um, and really lay out some ideas there that are different. That's the other thing that writing and speaking allows one to do, mm -hmm. is if you've got an, a good idea, writing and speaking makes you think through it so you can have a logical discussion or argument with somebody. It's not just, well, if you disagree with me, you're stupid and I'm right. That, that, that <laughs> doesn't cut it. You know, that works in elementary school, but beyond that, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, so it helps one hone your logic skills and ability to articulate and to make a case. Do you think the, the culture of uh, particularly the military has kind of swayed from previously when you, uh, you talked about in the culture previously, people writing or reading. Uh, do you think that's kind of assaged a little bit and it's a little bit better now to where people aren't as, have to do it kind of in secret or? Um, it's a mixed bag. I'll tell you what has really um, expanded uh, or enhanced folks' ability to express themselves is the explosion in social media. And that may be a good thing, maybe a bad thing. I mean, <laughs> You know, Twitter doesn't allow you to develop an argument very much. Mm -hmm. um, but writing an article or even a piece for a blog uh, uh, gets one into, into that uh, uh, arena. But I still wish that uh, uh, folks like yourselves and uh, mid and senior officers would do more writing. Mm -hmm. um, over the last 10 years, um, there has been a... Uh, homogenization uh, at senior leader ranks, and it's been mistaken as jointness. Well, mm -hmm. Going along to get along to be friends is not being joint. A jointness is bringing the right force to bear at the right place at the right time. Jointness is if you're in your service, jointness is being able to advocate and articulate the virtues and values of your service and what you can bring to the fight. Because if you can't lay that out, no one else will. A lot of people forget that. You know, they think that jointness is agreement. It's not. Um, look, in order to maintain our position as the world's sole superpower, I want to have the strongest Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard in the world, and Space Force now. Now, so the, 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 the institution, each one of those institutions are necessary elements of our Department of Defense. I want them all, okay? And it takes dedication in 20 to 25 years to learn how to become a good <coughs> division commander, surface action group commander, joint force air component commander, Marine Expeditionary Force commander, okay? So advocating for your service doesn't mean that you're eschewing or saying, well, we can do it all with air power. No one's ever said that. <laughs> but believe it or not, there are people that use that as an excuse that, whoa, I mean, you're, you're, you're being too pro Air Force. Mm -hmm. No, I'm laying out for you the truth. Because if I don't, in the tank, or at an op step meeting, or at a, uh, a, a meeting to determine a joint force doctrine, the subject's not going to come up. And too often, Air Force officers are the worst at this, and they're seen just being quiet in the back of the room. Because generally, if an airman raises his or her hand and says, hey, look, I got an idea, 
Um, how about, you know, we use a bomber to project power a thousand miles in less than five hours, uh, and we can be there the firstest with the mostest. Now, what do you think the Marine Corps, the Army, and the Navy are going to say about that? Just hypothetically, you end up, Arab people end up generally outvoted three to one. It's one of the reasons they fought so hard against having the chief of space operations as a four star sitting on the joint staff. They didn't have to want to deal with someone else who has a global perspective. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I digress. I could talk about that for, for hours, but. Um, no, that was awesome uh, information. And uh, I've, I've looked at your website, the Mitchell Institute website, yeah. and a lot of kind of what you've been talking about is on that. Like, uh, I was surprise, reading. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> so to, to kind of end things here, um, what could somebody who's never heard of the Mitchell Institute per se kind of uh, glean from going to the website and learning about what you all uh, are putting out there? Well, um, thanks for the opportunity to talk about Mitchell Institute. We essentially have, uh, you know, our vision is to actualize the virtues and values of aerospace power. Mm -hmm. That's the vision. <clears throat> How do we do that? We do that in three areas uh, with three objectives, if you will, or mission elements. The first one is to be able to educate the American public on the virtues and values of air and space power. The second one is to influence the resource debate in the policy debates that occur inside the beltway in the decision-making center of the universe. Hmm. Uh, you know, there are um, dozens and dozens of think tanks in the Washington DC area that have a lot of throw weight, if you will, mm -hmm. um, but very, very little perspective from an airman or an aerospace power professional's perspective. So that's what we try to bring to the fight. And then the third goal, is to cultivate aerospace-minded perspective mm -hmm. in a policy-making environment. So people understand the options that are out there. And so what we are still trying to, seven years later, I'm still trying to mature the website. Um, uh, you know, the way that we do this is through publications. We have three different types of publications. We have full-up studies, we have policy papers, and we have um, forum papers, which anybody who has an interest in writing, uh, you know, I'd encourage you to do that and your friends, give me a subject. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be focused on anything other than fit the general um, uh, category of defense related and strategy related to enhance US defense. So we take those, we, a matter of fact, we just published one uh, by a, retired Lieutenant Colonel Price Bingham on uh, air bases and as a, is the way that we have traditionally relied on basing become an Achilles heel. Mm -hmm. um, so I would hope that someone would go to the website first would go to the publication section and review the whole spectrum of issues that we've talked about over the last seven years because I think there's a lot of valuable information there. There is. That, it, yeah. That's what Mitchell Institute's all about. Well, I sure appreciate you giving people uh, that perspective. And I, once again, I could talk all day about uh, Air Force kind of, you know, leadership skills, writing, reading, and why that's so important. Uh, and your perspective on everything is just, uh, wow. <laughs> Thank you very much for all that. Well, that's very kind of you. Let me just uh, finish up by reminding you and your audience that, uh, you know, you can't beat the three core values of the Air Force when it comes to summarizing what leadership is. Mm -hmm. Integrity first, excellence in all you do, and service before self. Um, and at the very beginning, I was gonna tell you a story about a goal my dad set for me mm -hmm. that has really kind of defined my life and still has. And that's a good thing about setting goals. You don't wanna set yourself a goal that you reach it and then you gotta come up with another one, okay? Uh, and uh, it, it, he took me to the south gate to the entrance of the University of Virginia, and there was a quote mm -hmm. written up there by Thomas Jefferson. And essentially it runs like this, seek the path of honor, the light of truth, and the will to work for mankind. And uh, that stuck in my cranium for 40 plus years now. Uh, uh, and I think it's a good one. Uh, and uh, uh, so... 
let me finish with that and thank you for the opportunity to chat with you and wish you all the best. Thank you, sir, for your time.